You're listening to From the Midlands, the stories of people making a difference across the region. Our presenter is Gail Downey. In this episode of From the Midlands, we're at the Central England Rehabilitation Unit in Leamington. And joining us is the clinical lead nurse, Cathy Wagstaff. Hello, Cathy. Tell us how you came to work here. Many, many years ago, I started my career um, working in trauma and always had a fascination with brain injuries and how they present and how it affects their life. Went off and did lots of other things in my career, kept getting drawn back to brain injuries every now and again. And then when this job came up, this was my dream job. This is what gets me excited. This is what makes me want to come to work and look after people with brain injuries. And what is it in particular that you really like about your role here? My particular role I think because I have the support around me that we can really make a difference to people's lives. These are the people that come here, work going about their normal daily business, going to work, walking their dog, doing some repairs on their house and then they've had an injury that has changed their whole life. And how do you help when you're here? So we do a whole barrage of assessments on patients when they get here so we from a nursing point of view we we look after all their nursing needs whether they've got extra tubes to help them breathe or to go to the to the bathroom to give fluids to give food artificially and then we work within our therapist team to educate and support the patient to be able to progress through those stages the absolute aim is to get them as independent as possible but we also recognise that some patients will never get that ability back and it's how we support them to live as independently as they can with that deficit that they've got. How surprised are you by the turnaround in terms of some patients will get back to being as independent as possible whereas others may well struggle. So the patients that come here have had a prolonged stay in usually in an intensive care unit in a high dependency ward at a trauma centre or a major trauma centre. So it's always a little bit surprising. Some patients who when you first meet them you have a rough idea of what you think they can achieve will absolutely go above and beyond and almost make a, a full recovery. Um, other patients that you think actually I think they're going to do very well they haven't got the capacity in their within their brain injury to make us such a good improvement um, but we always get everyone to the best point that they can possibly get so they can then carry on their rehabilitation in the community and get back to some sort of normality. We're incredibly fragile as human beings aren't we? Extremely fragile and it really does make you start thinking about your own <clears throat> mortality and especially the mechanism of some injuries that you could have just tumbled off your bi- bicycle while you were out walking missing a, the bottom step of a ladder and falling backwards it, they don't have to be high impact road traffic collisions they can be very simple things that we all do day to day and we're joined here by Gregory Weston who was a patient here he now runs a movement group at the hospital he volunteers here and and Greg your injury was simply that you fell over hit your head on a lad's night out and that caused immense damage immense trauma yeah I was on a night out with um with my friends fell over hit my head on the curb and got rushed to Paul hospital actually which is the local hospital where I were and having walked onto the ambulance I then fell into a coma had to be rushed to Southampton Hospital uh, where they put me straight on a life support machine and um, I was just I didn't respond at all and after three weeks of no response whatsoever my dad was called into a meeting and said look he's not shown any sign of recovery we believe if he is going to survive which we don't think he will he'll just be brain dead do you want to keep him alive and my dad said well he wouldn't want to live like that and so they went to turn the machine off as they did. I opened my eyes, so it's an utter miracle that I'm alive, really. This was all just from a fall and just hitting your head. Yeah, yeah, which makes you just think how, I mean, just going back to what we were kind of like discussing there, just how fragile life is, isn't it? You know, one minute, I'm just on a night out with my mates, which I've been doing, I was 35 at the time of my accident. And, you know, I've been doing that for 
well, probably too many years to think of before that, to be, to be honest. But, mm. so, you know, a, a, everyone always says to me, well, that could have been me. It could have been any of us. So, you know, was it, was it God? Was it karma that he was saying, look, now's your time to have this so that you can use your experience to help other people, you know, get off the rat race of just trying to earn money, so on and so forth. And you came here to the hospital. You know Cathy and you know her her team. What was it like being a patient here? I think I came here probably in, in the, the back end of 2011 and I was here for a year. I mean, Cathy knows all about this. I had some issues. All the staff sort of knew who I was and my brain injury, obviously. Um, you lose your filter and your... Being, being inappropriate was my tagline. You know, I've got lots of there's things in this hospital called an ABC chart. It stands for antecedent behavioural consequence, which every time you do something wrong, you get an ABC chart. I think I got 28 in a month, which I, I think is still probably a hospital record of some kind. So it didn't just affect you physically, it also affected your speech and your interaction with other people? Massively, massively. And yeah, my, my memory was, was really bad. So like I'd have my dinner and half an hour having been taken back to my room, I'd ring the bell saying, take me for dinner. And you'd go, Greg, what do you mean? You've just eaten a three course meal. And I was going, but I'm really hungry. And I'd forgotten that I had it. So they used to actually make me sign. So I'd have to go, go for my dinner and they'd have to say, it's like sign a sheet saying, I have had my dinner. Because I put on a lot of weight as well. I had an addiction to things like Werther's Originals and chewing gum. I used to get my friends to post them in. Again, the hospital had to write to my friends saying, please stop doing this because one night he got all his chewing gum stuck in his hair and I fell asleep with a ball of about eight pieces of chewing gum stuck in my mouth. Fell asleep and I had to shave my hair off to get the chewing gum out. I put on like six stone. I went up to 18 and a half stone, which is clinically obese. I remember they had to actually show me like a wide wheelchair and saying, look, if you don't lose weight, you're going to have to go in one of these and that kind of work. So it's just, a, it's just, it was a whole host of things as well. Your emotions, it affects. You know, I lost temper with my friends because they wouldn't bring in me Werther's Originals and I'd send them away. I mean, I feel really ashamed to, to say it now, to be honest. But um, as I said to you earlier, I'm documenting it all in a book which will hopefully be able to... One, one, my karma, like I think I said to you before, is if I can use my experience to help other people, whether that be through volunteering here at the hospital or now writing my book, then that kind of like sort of makes me, helps me accept what's happened. So, Cathy, the symptoms, if you can call them that, of what Greg was going through, you know, almost obsessing, really, over some things, is that the hidden side of when people have a brain injury? It is, and each person is unique. So what Greg was discussing is that um, some of his injury was at the front of his head in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe injuries usually make you lose your disinhibitions, you're quick to anger, and you can perseverate, which is that you fixate on something. So yeah. one of Greg's little um, perseverations was around, around food, that even if he had eaten and he felt full, his, his brain was still telling him, no, you're, you're not full, you haven't had your dinner, go off and seek more food. So it's working to, to try and turn that around so that... And how difficult is that compared with helping a physical injury? Really difficult, and I don't profess to be the expert, and that's why we have an excellent team of psychologists who will work with patients on a one-to-one -one basis for that. You are one of the top brain injury units in England and Northern Ireland as well. How did you get that accolade? So when our patients first arrive here, we use a score and each week that patients are here, we rescore them. And then when the patient is discharged, we look at what their scores were on admission and what scores are at the end. And that tells us how much of an improvement they've made. And that can be in anything from eating to walking to managing emotions. Behaviour. Yeah, behaviours, um, and we can see the progress that they've made, but we can also show the patients as well before they go home. This is, you might not feel that you've done a lot, but actually this is where you were when you first come here, and this is where you are now when you're leaving. I mean, I have to say, yeah, I mean, I owe a lot to this place. I mean, for one, I've managed to get out of a wheelchair. So physically, it, it was, it's been amazing. Behaviour-wise, it's been 
quite quite an improvement. Yeah, you're but right hopefully you'll right say right that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about all right now, I think. Um, and then yeah, it helped me. Like the psychology department helped me a lot. Like, because when you have a brain injury, you lose control of your finances. You obviously lose your driving license, all that kind of stuff. But the psychology department here helped me with all, all of that side of things as well, and as well as with the behaviour as well. And moving forward, you're actually coming back to the hospital to volunteer. <clears throat> what made you come back when some people would think, oh no, that's the last place I want to go once because I got well? Because I, I wanted to give something back to the place that taught me so much and to be able to give back um, something to, to, to fellow disabled patients as, as well. It's been very rewarding. I, I like it. It's basically... Um, I struggle mentally in accepting what's happened to me and accepting that I am disabled, I do limp badly. I'm trying to need to find a reason as to what, you know, instead of sitting down and saying, why me? I feel feeling sorry for myself. I can actually say to myself, look, this has happened for a reason and look, I'm doing good out of it now. If I hadn't have had my accident, I wouldn't have been able to set up this movement group, which is so rewarding for me. You've also done many things for charity, raised money, haven't you? Tell me about some of those. I walked at Mount Snowden in 2018 which I raised a lot of money for a girl who'd had got a brain tumour and that was with your leg which you have yeah. to sometimes sort of drag it along well like, yeah the, the rocks are like literally like over a foot high and two of my dear friends um, who'd actually done the Snowden marathon and said that they found that easier than walking up with me um, was having to actually lift my leg up over the rocks and it took me I think seven and a half hours. I mean, it would probably, in my, you know, when I was fit, it would have probably taken, back in the day, it probably take me less than two hours to put that into perspective. And the, the, the elements were just shocking. Like the wind was coming, like the rain, the hail was coming down, it was hailing, it was coming down sideways, the wind, sleet. I'm not joking, it was, it was horrific. I think one of my friends said at one point, he was thinking, just pushing me off, it would have been easier. Well, calling an air ambulance or something harsh. yeah but it, it 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 was it was it was a great achievement i mean i got some quite a few long-standing injuries afterwards but again recently i wanted to raise money for the birmingham children's hospital through um a friend of mine who's who say it saved they saved a friend of mine's son from leukemia he got to ring the bell there and the work they do there is phenomenal i did a, a marathon bike ride which again was, was quite an achievement. I raised over four thousand pounds, which it was nice to give a check. For, to, so I actually they invited me in and I did a presentation and they showed me around and all the great work they did and what that four thousand pounds would have bought. It was phenomenal. And again, I, I wouldn't have raised that money had I not been disabled. Going back to the point of being more, well, you know, rather than just sitting feeling sorry for myself, like go out and do things and raise money as a result of me having my accident it's like kind of like my karma as I said again before Kathy how many people get to this stage that Greg has got to where he wants to give back I know that might be quite a difficult question because it depends on individuals I mean it is a difficult question so at least half of our volunteers here are patients who patients or relatives who've had some sort of contact with the service and feel that they want to give something back because we we cover such a large area a lot of our patients don't actually automatically come from this area so we, what we tend to find is they go and volunteer in in similar situations nearer to home um, especially if they can't drive or yeah. can't ride a bike anymore so people tend to do a bit more volunteering that's local and nearer to home we're, we're just lucky that greg is only around the corner one of the things I know you've introduced recently, and I think you're either the first or the only rehabilitation unit to allow pets in. Tell me about that. We are. So, as a massive dog lover, it was how, how can I get a dog into work <laughs> and make it legitimate? So, we worked with a company called Pets as Therapy, and they have brought mm. some amazing dogs into the unit over the last couple of years from golden retrievers right down to our cockapoo and our one-eyed um, little shih tzu called dr banjo and they are they make such a difference to patients lives so as i said earlier they've probably had a long stay in itu probably a long stay on a trauma ward and by the time they get to us they've probably been in hospital six months and if they have a pet at home by that point they are really really missing their pet yeah. and the dog's probably really 
dog or the cat's probably missing them as well. So we start introducing the dogs. Um, they have a very calming effect, effect on people. It, nice it brings a bit of joy. Um, nicer than humans a lot of the time as well. Absolutely. <laughs> um, they keep floors nice and clean too, going around licking up all the crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> and they... Uh, and then we built that up to a cat as well. So we have a cat called Bandit who likes to come in. I'm working. We've had a ra- we had a racehorse. Now I wouldn't say this was a pets as therapy project, but we because we see quite a lot of jockeys with head injuries, um, their horses mm-hmm. miss them too. So we've had horses out on the car park, and it's just really important it's to get. A bit difficult to get around the wards, so aren't well, they? Believe me, if that horse could have got low enough to get through the door, I'd have brought it in. <laughs> From when you first started working with brain injuries. How has the service developed in oh. terms of either technology and improvements to health? Absolutely massively. So everything is technology orientated now and we're, we're currently, one of the things for the future, we're looking at virtual reality and how we can build that into rehabilitation as well um, because it, it's a very easy thing and it, it's widely out there now and it's very developed. Even the simple things, like when I first started with brain injuries, we had the old-fashioned beds that you had to pump up, and so we all had wonderful fit legs. Really? Um, but, yeah, we everything's electri- electronic now um, and makes life so much easier. And we are very, very fortunate that this building was purpose-built for us because, over time, the equipment has grown, so hoists have got bigger, chairs have got bigger... We, we have a lot more technology that we need to bring in and use. I mean, when I, when I first started mm. out, you had your little bag with your blood pressure cuff and your stethoscope. Now it's all big electronic machines that we take round mm. um, that are more accurate. So healthcare's got bigger, just, just generally more technology focused. And what is it for you that makes you get up and come in here every day? What's your personal success? Ooh. Apart from me. Apart from Greg. Let me think. <laughs> I'm stuck now, Greg, apart from me. I think it's that you never, ever know what's going to happen from day to day. We see some very, very sad cases come, come to us for rehabilitation. And you might be having a really difficult day and it might be really sad or someone might have really challenging behaviours and then someone will just do something new whether that's the first time they lifted the spoon or the first time they gave us a thumbs up or first smile and it just redresses that balance that you know today was a today was a great day and Greg for you there, there's always someone worse off so when I'm, I have days of feeling sorry for myself and I'm thinking oh I fell over today or I got called weird or someone was saying that I limped badly or something like that or my son was too embarrassed me to watch him play football because of my being disabled you know you come in here and see people who, who who can't you know speak or talk or move any limbs or they're dribbling or, or whatever and it's just going back to, to that sort of that there's always somebody worse off it refocus you it, that's refocuses a good way of putting it yeah it, refo- it helps refocus you yeah and you're going to write a book Called impossible, impossible yeah yeah my, my my favorite I used, my mum who's in heaven now watching over me I know she's with me all the time she used to love the actress Audrey Hepburn and uh, one of Audrey Hepburn's famous quotes is nothing is impossible the word itself says I'm possible so whenever I look at impossible I don't see impossible I see I'm possible and that's really like that's kind of like my mantra for writing the book and it's been very therapeutic, actually, to be able to recount my journey. Like, I'm, my, my long-term memory is actually very good. I think it's the complexities of the front or the or one of the, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the um, results of having a frontal lobe injury is that it affects your short-term memory. So my short-term memory is terrible, like names I'm, like, shockingly bad at. Um, like, you know, someone will say, oh, hi, my name's so-and-so, and within a minute I've forgotten it. It's quite embarrassing, really, but... We just call all the men Dave and all the women darling. It's just the easiest way. To, <laughs> um, again, sometimes getting trouble for that as well. But so I start off by talking about my childhood, my upbringing, and stuff like that, which is was very privileged. And then I talk about the accident, my time here, my volunteering, fundraising, 
my involvement with an organization called Motion Rehab, which is up in Leeds, which is a neurological rehabilitation center, which has been a big part of my life uh, as well. Talked about my, like my, my relationships with girlfriends and friends, how they've been affected, my family. I've had some, some quite complex family things, which I'll obviously let you read the book to find out about. But it's been very, very, very rewarding, actually, writing that book and very cathartic. And you'll come back and do another interview once the book's done. Yes, most definitely. And and the fundraising as well. I mean, I've got to be careful. I want to continue to raise money for the Birmingham Children's Hospital because I'm totally, totally overwhelmed by the work they do there. And I've just got to think more sensibly now about something that's not going to cause me long-term injuries in doing it. So I might just, we might, we could have to, we might do a tandem bungee jump with Kathy or or a skydive <laughs> or something. I have ideas, I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll find you a volunteer to, to stand in my well, we, place. We could, we, could do a, we could do a skydive together, couldn't we? Or you, could, or you could push me out of a plane. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so, but yeah, but, but that's, and again, I think, as I said to you earlier, I want to um, focus my attention now on moving from One thing I haven't talked to you about, actually, is the work that I've really enjoyed in doing talks. So I've gone into my old school, Surly Hall School, and done a talk there. I've done one at Southampton Physiotherapy Department, obviously where I was in hospital. I met, actually met the nurse who looked after me when I was in the coma. It was a great comfort to, to my father. Um, I've done one at Warwick School, which was interesting because they're arch rivals of Surly Hill School. I've done st- some stuff at uh, Kings High. So I want to do lots more talks. That's very important to me. More interviews like I'm doing with you today. And um, yeah, and obviously keep on my volunteering as well which is a big part of my life okay greg weston thank you for telling your story thank you girl kathy wagstar clinical lead nurse at the central england rehabilitation unit thank you very much for your time too thank you you've been listening to from the midlands a whirlwind production If you've enjoyed listening and would like to sponsor this series of podcasts, details are available on our website at fromthemidlands.co.uk.